11.40. I guess we can get started. Hello and welcome to Clean Architecture with ASP NetCore 2.2. I'm Jason Taylor and I'm an SSW Solution Architect. You can find me on Twitter at JasonGTAU or on my blog codeinflow.net. I try to blog once a week so the content's nice and fresh. I last blogged at NDC Sydney 2018 in September. So I'm not quite reaching that, but I'm going to improve. Um, someone from my company came to me last week and said, would it be okay if you blog once a month? And I said, yeah, that's, that's fine. I try to blog once a week, so I think I can achieve once a month. Um, I've been a developer now for 19 years, and I've learned the most important principle is KISS, or keep it simple stupid. And this principle states that systems should be kept simple rather than made more complicated. And today, I'm going to show you the simplest approach to building enterprise applications with clean architecture. And this is the simplest approach because what I build is not simple or trivial. I build medium to large to complex applications. So you could definitely do things differently in something that's simple and trivial, but that's not what this is about. This is about enterprise application development. Let's get started. With clean architecture, the domain and the application layer are at the center of the design. This is known as the core of the application. Now, in the domain, we have enterprise logic and types, and in the application layer, we have business logic and types. The difference being that the enterprise logic could be shared across multiple systems, whereas the business logic will exist only in this system. Now, rather than have core depend on concerns such as data access and persistence, we invert these dependencies. So, um, infrastructure, persistence and presentation all depend on core. This is achieved by adding abstractions or interfaces inside of core, which are then implemented by layers outside of core. A good example is the repository pattern. So if we wanted to implement the repository pattern in this design, then we would add an I repository inside of core, which is implemented then maybe as EF core or Mongo in the persistence layer. Now, um, with, with this design, all dependencies flow inwards and core has no dependencies. So infrastructure, persistence and presentation depend on core but not on one another. And this results in an architecture and design that's independent of frameworks. Core doesn't need any frameworks to exist. It's testable. We can test the logic in the inside of core without a UI, without a database and without a web server. And it's easy to test. There aren't any external dependencies. And we know the logic's the most important part of our application, so this is very important. It's independent of the UI. We'll have the flexibility to change the UI easily, and that's a good thing. Right now, we're dealing with a lot of different web frameworks, Angular, React, Vue. We want to move to the latest and greatest, and we'll be moving to Blazor. Um, so we want that flexibility. When we do move um, to a new presentation technology, we're not going to impact the logic inside of core. It's independent of that. It's independent of the database. So right now we might be using SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, um, but soon we'll be switching to Cosmos DB. It's gonna be a lot cooler when we're building Blazor applications on Cosmos DB. And finally, it's independent of anything external. Core simply doesn't know anything about the outside world. Now, with this design, you can see that there's only three layers. Now, you might need more or you might need less. It just depends on the complexity of your application. The only thing you need to keep in mind is those dependencies need to continue to point inwards. That's what gives us the great flexibility and the high maintainability, and that's going to be the difference between an application that lasts a few years to an application that's going to last 20 years. So this is my example, Northwind Traders. Show of hands, who's heard of Northwind Traders? Pretty much everyone. Northwind Traders is cool, right? No one. No one thinks Northwind Traders is cool. I might change your mind. So it's now cross-platform. I've upgraded it. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So that's good. It's .NET Core 2.2. Soon I'll upgrade it to 3. EF Core 2.2. Code first. And data seeded. That's cool, right? Northwind Traders is cool again. Let's take a look. So this is my Northwind Traders solution. You can find it on GitHub. 
Um, I'm going to share a link at the end so you don't need to take note of this. Um, but I just wanted to point out, when you go to the repo, there's some nice instructions here on how to get started and what you'll need. And we can follow along with these instructions just to get it running. I only want to show you one thing initially, just how to launch the application because there are two parts to it. Um, this has an Angular front end, and so to launch the Angular front end, we use um, we go to the command prompt Northwind Web UI client app, and we just have to run npm start, and that'll launch the front end. Now from the back end, we can just go to the Web UI project, and we can just press Control F5, um, and that'll launch the back end. Um, if you launch the back end. Without the front end running as it is now, you'll see this exception. Don't be alarmed. Um, sometimes my laptop just needs a little bit more time to get started. So there we go. It's running. And if we come here and launch, that's all good. So this is a sample application. It does have some functionality, but its purpose is primarily to demonstrate uh, the principles of clean architecture um, and the key points that I'd like to make in this presentation. Um, it has a nice um, open API behind it, so you can explore the API and see some of the functionality, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I just wanted to give you a tour of, of the project. So I'll zoom in here for you. Here we go. So you can see the solutions broken up into a number of folders correlating to the folders in the architecture and design I showed you earlier. Um, there's a docs folder here and that contains a readme. Um, that's the GitHub readme. So you, you, you can take a look at that. And then there's the slides from the presentation. So when you do go and have a look at this, you'll have all of the resources from today. Now you can see here, I have my core layers, application and domain. And inside each of those, there are readmes also. So you can get an understanding at each layer um, what should be contained within there. I have my infrastructure layer, which contains infrastructure and persistence. I didn't mention this earlier, um, but persistence really is a kind of infrastructure. We just separate it out because we've got a few concerns in there that we're going to encapsulate. And so you could separate out other infrastructure concerns in the, in the same way. So if you wanted to have a Northwind.security for your authentication and authorization concerns, that would be an appropriate choice. I have a northwind.common project, which is for my cross-cutting concerns, and it has no dependencies. Um, any of those other projects can depend on common. It's a good place for things like string extensions or date time extensions, whatever, whatever type of thing you might want to put in there. Uh, and then you can see I've got a bunch of tests um, just, to, just to keep it all running nice and healthily. Okay, skip through that. So key points for this first section. The domain contains the enterprise-wide logic and types, and that's the logic that we can use in multiple systems. The application contains the business logic and types, and that's the logic that's specific to this application. Infrastructure, including persistence, includes all external concerns, and the presentation and infrastructure depend only on application, not on each other. So infrastructure and presentation components can be replaced with minimal effort. Um, and that's because we're not going to affect core when we do that. It has no external concerns. So now we're going to have a look at the domain layer, followed by every other layer in the application. And essentially, in this talk, I'll make some key points. I'll highlight the things that I think are important um, so, so that you get a good understanding of the project. Uh, but you'll also want to dive in and take a look for yourself because there's a lot more going on um, than I can include in, in the time allowed in this talk. So inside of the domain layer, we have entities, value objects, enumerations, logic, and exceptions. Let's take a look. So the first key point that I'd like to make is regarding the use of data annotations. So you can see what I have here is an entity called customer, and it's nice and clean. Um, but if I look at the history, we can actually find a version that includes data annotations. Here we go. So this is another version. I'll make, I'll make that much bigger for you. Let's go 150. 
There we go. So this version contains data annotations. And, and in the past, the earlier versions of uh, EF, we used to use data annotations all the time. And they had two purposes, and that was to instruct the ORM how to create the relational model, and also to provide validation. But in newer versions of EF Core, um, it doesn't do the validation anymore. You can use data annotations for validation. It's just not something that EF Core uses it for. And it also, um, it does still use it for relational modeling, but there's a much better way to do that. Uh, we, can, we can actually use Fluent API um, configuration instead, and that means that we can keep our entities nice and clean and looking like this. Because really, those sort of concerns don't belong in our domain layer anyway. We want to keep that into the infrastructure layer, specifically in the persistence project. Now the next point that I'd like to make, uh, we, can, we can use this example again, is to initialize all collections and also to make the, private, uh, the setters private or to remove them all together. And you might think, well, why will I do that? And it, it's just because it makes life easier. If we do that, we don't need to think when we're accessing a new customer object, we don't need to say, hmm, I wonder if the orders collection has been initialized. I'll write an if statement. If customers.orders equals null, then initialize the orders collection. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, and, and we gain control of the object. It's, it's about uh, helping your developers in um, ensuring that they fall into the pit of success. We make it easy for them to do the right thing and hard for them to do the wrong thing. So the next one that I want to talk about is when you're designing your system, let me just see, I want you to think about this, this entity. Um, we, we often use primitive types where, where we shouldn't be using primitive types. So here we have an AD account and its type is string. And that's fine, AD accounts are strings, but not all strings are valid AD accounts. Um, there's certain rules in the way that AD accounts can be created, the, the value, and there's certain ways in which we'll use the AD account. For example, sometimes we'll want just the domain name and sometimes we'll want just the username and sometimes we want it all together in some kind of display format. Now that's logic. There's validation and logic associated with using this AD account. Now if we don't find somewhere to encapsulate this, that's going to be problematic. That In a large system, that logic is going to appear time and time again because new developers, experienced developers, may not know about it. So we need a good way to encapsulate that logic in a complex type. And that's where value objects can really help. So you can see here, I've changed it to a value object, and let's take a look at the implementation. Actually, let's take a look at the tests. Okay, so I have this AD account, and um, it should have the correct domain and name. So I can construct it using this factory method, and all I have to do is pass in the AD account string, and then I'll have access to the domain and the name. So that's nice and easy. I won't have to write logic around that. Uh, I've got a method to string which I've overridden and it returns the correct format. So we can see that um, if I construct a new object, uh, it's going to return the format which will essentially be SSW slash JSON, the original format. I have an implicit conversion operator, so I can take an AD account type and implicitly convert it to a string, which is great for what, whatever purposes I need um, in the string format. Uh, logging is one that comes to mind. Uh, I have an explicit conversion operator, so I can directly cast from a string to an AD account. And I control the creation of the AD object. If the AD account is not valid, the AD account string, it doesn't contain a slash, then that's going to fail. And, and it brings me to my next point, which is to use custom domain exceptions. This exception, AD account invalid exception, will be a lot easier to debug than the index out of range exception that would otherwise be thrown. I'll have a quick look at the implementation. So you can see here it has a, pr a private constructor. I'm controlling the construction of this object through the factory method. Uh, it essentially splits the string into two parts um, and this is where it could throw an index out of range exception. So I catch any exceptions and just say, hey, there's something wrong with this AD account. So that's much better. I have this type, it encapsulates all the logic associated with it, uh, and I don't have to worry about logic appearing elsewhere. When my developers use this type, they're going to fall into the pit of success again. They're not going to think about how do I get just the domain part, how do I think get just the name part. 
so when you're building your entities, just think about this property that I'm creating, is it really a string or is it more complex than that? Will I have logic associated with it? Is it a primitive type or is it a complex type? Okay, so key points for the domain layer. Avoid using data annotations. There are better ways. They clutter up our domain, and we'll see that soon, the better approach. Use value objects where appropriate. I mentioned before, just think about it. Is it really a primitive type, or is it more complex? Initialize all collections and privates, and use private setters. Help your developers to fall into the pit of success, and create custom domain exceptions. They're much easier to debug than an index out of range exception. So now we're going to look at the application layer. The application layer contains interfaces, models, view models and DTOs, logic, commands and queries, we'll talk about that soon, and validators, and again, custom exceptions. So CQRS, we all know by now CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and with CQRS we separate our reads from our writes. And the benefits include uh, maximizing performance and scalability, and that's awesome. But for me, the most important benefit is simplicity. I find that when I use CQRS, everything becomes easier. It's easy to add new features because I can just add a new query or command, and it's easy to maintain. Our changes should be nicely isolated to a single query or command, and so we're less likely to introduce bugs. Now, if you like CQRS, then you'll love using CQRS with Mediator. They're like the perfect couple. So with Mediator, we de define our commands and queries as requests. So the application layer just becomes a series of requests response objects. And with that, we get the fantastic ability to introduce additional behavior. So we can add functionality before and or after each request. So behavior such as um, cross-cutting concerns such as logging, uh, caching, validation, um, and security become easier because we're using Mediator. We get this really nice pipeline, which is powerful. So let's take a look. Okay, so you can see here in the application layer, I've separated things by feature. So everything related to customers is in this customers folder. And there's only two things, there's commands and queries. If we expand those, it's really obvious what everything in those folders um, will do. We know that if we go into here, it will be a create customer command. And if we come into here, that will be where we can work with our get customers list feature, and that's a query. Let's take a look at this one. Inside of this folder, I have everything that I need to work on this feature. I don't have a separate folder for my view models. I don't have a separate folder for my um, DTOs. I don't have a separate folder for my handlers. So when I'm ready to change this feature, it's all here. I don't have to jump around to find what I'm looking for. Now with Mediator, we define our commands and queries as requests. So you can see in this case, this is a DTO for getting a list of customers. At the moment, it doesn't have any properties, um, but I might start to add some. So I might say things like page size, um, filtering abilities, what page that I'm currently on. Um, but with, with the uh, Mediator framework, we define these as type I request and then the return type. So this query will return a customer's list view model. If we jump in here and look at the handler, we can see it's quite simple. We're injecting an I Northwind DB context and a mapper for auto mapper, and we're simply constructing a, a new customer's list view model. And this is, this is a very nice approach because what's contained within here are only the things needed to return this query. We don't have a large service that's responsible for many things, which becomes hard to navigate. It's a single file with a single purpose. You can see um, the create customer command 
is quite simple also. So this is our DTO. It's a request as well. It doesn't return anything, so we're not specifying that here. Uh, and it contains everything that we need to go ahead and create a customer. Now I've taken a slightly different approach here. Um, I've actually nested the handler inside the command and that can help to improve discoverability. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You can see again, it's quite straightforward. Um, essentially, I'm creating a new customer entity. I'm adding that, saving the changes, and publishing a customer created event. And then with Mediator, I can create handlers that have specific functionality for that event as well. The next thing I want to talk about is validation. So we mentioned that data annotations um, are not so good at the domain level. Well, I think they're not so good at this level also. Data annotations are okay. We can use them for simple validation scenarios, but not so much for complex validation scenarios. Um, for that, I prefer to use fluent validation. And let me, let me show you an example. Oops. So here I have an update customer command and it just has the DTO to update a customer. And then I have an update customer command validator. So with fluent validation, I'm able to define the validation rules using a fluent syntax in a separate file. And these rules are obviously simple. They're, they're, they're no more complicated than what you can support with data annotations. But down here, I have a couple of example, more complex rules. So you can see here, I have a rule for the postal code. When the country is equal to Australia, then the postcode should match this regular expression. Essentially, it should be four digits. And if not, it will return this error. Australian postcodes have four digits. So that's not much more complicated, but it is a nice syntax. Um, we can do that with data annotations. But we also have this one. We have a rule for the phone. It must have a Queensland landline when the country is equal to Australia and the postcode starts with four. So in this case, we're actually looking at um, cross-field validation. And we can do a lot with, with fluent validation in this way. Really, we take full control of the validation scenarios, and so the implementation is up to us. Yes, question? Why do you put that in the application layer separately from the model which you have the domain layer? I'm not validating um, domain entities. I'm validating uh, the commands or queries, the requests to the application. So this is kind of the first line of defense because everything's coming in as a request. Is this Sorry, what was that? Uh, no, no, it's in it's in the application layer. Um, I like to have the things that change together together. And so the, the command and the command validator sit together so that when I need to update that feature, it's easy to access those things. I prefer not to have to jump around. Okay, so one of the other things about using Mediator I mentioned is we get that pipeline. And so <clears throat> to run these validators, I have what's called a pipeline behavior. And if we look at this, this is a request validation behavior. So remember, everything that's coming into this application is a request. And I have a pipeline behavior which handles these requests. So the request might be of type create customer command or get customer detail query. If there are validators associated with those commands or queries, this little process here will run them and if there are exceptions, it will return a validation exception. So that's a custom exception that we're throwing from the application layer. So that means the request validation is automatic. Uh, the developers don't need to think about that. If they associate a, a validator with a request, then it will be validated. And that's great. That's part of the mediator's uh, pipeline. So here we have another simple behavior. This is an I request preprocessor. So it happens before the request runs in Mediator, and it's quite simple. Essentially, we get a request, let's say create customer command. I take the name of that request, and I just log it using .NET Core's built-in logging um, abstraction. So I just say Northwind request, create customer command, and then I take the actual request DTO, everything that's in the create customer command, and I serialize that. So that's gonna be available in the log. 
And then finally, I have another one, which is just a simple uh, request performance behavior. And so this one is a pipeline behavior like the validator. So with this one, I start a timer, I complete the, complete the request, get the response and stop the timer. And if the request happens to take greater than 500 milliseconds, um, then I log a warning to the database in much the same way as I was logging the information. So um, that's, kind of, that's kind of great. Any request that comes into the system with a few lines of code, I can log that request. I can, um, I can uh, when I add the user details, I'll be able to filter it by user, set the date range, and I can see kind of what they were doing or where they had the problem and what kind of exceptions were associated with that. And because the request itself has been serialized, I can take that serialized request and I can add that to a test that's probably going to fail because, well, the customer's complaining and then I can fix it and the test will pass. So that's pretty cool. All right, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about was abstractions. So in this, in this layer, we have a couple of uh, abstractions. So I have the iNorthwind DB context, um, which is my interface instead of using the DB context directly. Now this is a compromise. I've chosen to use Entity Framework Core directly because make no mistake, even though this is an interface, I still need a dependency on Entity Framework Core in this application. Now, if I wanted to avoid that, um, if I had a good reason to use the repository and unit of work, then I would actually implement those patterns and I wouldn't need the dependency on Entity Framework Core. But these are some of the real decisions we make when we build software today. We know the right thing to do, but we make choices based on um, speed and cost and quality. The other interface that I have in here is a demonstrative iNotification service. And the important thing to note is it doesn't matter where the implementation for the notification server is, service is. It's going to be an in infrastructure somewhere, but the core only depends on this interface. And this message type, that's not coming from infrastructure, that's coming from core as well. So I'm sure that if we use a service like Sangrid or something else, it's going to have our own types and we could easily take a dependency on that and that would save us time. But that means that we will be tightly coupled to that framework. And when we want to change to a new messaging service, we'll have to rewrite those types. So just avoid that straight away. Make sure that the interface is within core, make sure that the types are within core and do the mapping necessary. Okay, key points. Using CQRS and Mediator simplifies your overall design. Fluent validation is useful for all validation scenarios. Uh, Mediator simplifies cross-cutting concerns. We get that really great pipeline so we can implement all sorts of things there. And it's independent of infrastructure and data access concerns. All right, now we look at the persistence layer. So inside of the persistent layer, we have our DB context because this solution is using Entity Framework Core. We have migrations, configurations, seeding, abstractions. So here's the big question, it used to be a bigger question, should we implement these patterns? And I'm gonna answer for you because every time I ask the question, most people say no now. There'll be one or two people who'll say yes. But the fact of the matter is, with architecture and design, it always depends. Now, in the general case, it's not always the best choice because EF Core insulates your code from database changes. EF Core is an abstraction, and we choose a database provider to work with that abstraction. We can choose SQL Server, we can choose Postgres, now we can choose Cosmos DB. DB Context acts as a unit of work. It's implementing that pattern, and the DB set acts as a repository. So a common reason for implementing these patterns with earlier versions of VF and with other ORMs is for unit testing. But now EF Core has features for unit testing without repositories in the way of the EF Core in-memory provider. So that's what I think, but what do the experts think? So Jimmy Bogard, who was at the conference this week, uh, he's the chief architect at Headspring and the creator of Automapper and Mediator, which we're using in this solution. He says that I'm over repositories and definitely over abstracting your data layer. 
So I'd say I'd say he's against implementing repositories and unit of work in, in, in most scenarios. Then we have Steve Smith, Microsoft MVP and regional director for uh, almost 10 years. And he says, no, you don't need a repository, but there are many benefits and you should consider it. Now, I think Steve is being very diplomatic here. I think that if you came to him and showed him your solution and you didn't have a repository, he'd show you why you need it. So very diplomatic. He says you don't need it, but I think he's kind of on the side of implementing a repository. And next we have uh, John Smith, the author of Entity Framework Core in Action. And he says, no, the unit of rep uh, the repository slash unit of work pattern isn't useful with Entity Framework Core. So even the experts don't agree. And what does that tell us? Well, it's simple. As is the case with all design patterns, we need to think about the problem that they're trying to solve. If, if, the pattern, um, if applying the pattern solves that problem for us, then go ahead and implement it. If you implement it without a problem to solve, then it just introduces unnecessary complexity. So same approach, all design patterns. Okay, let's have a look at the persistence layer. Okay, so the first point that I'd like to make is the persistence layer is independent of the database. Uh, insofar as there is a provider that we can change to with Entity Framework Core. You can see in this particular application, the provider I'm using is SQL Server. So I could change that to Postgres, so in that way it's independent of the database. I have changed this solution to Postgres in the past um, and, and run it on uh, Linux and it works quite well. We talked about not using data annotations in the domain layer. So how do we configure the ORM so that, um, so that it knows how to map from the object model to the relational model? We use Fluent API configurations. So in our Fluent API configuration for customer, we define everything that we need. And it's outside of the domain layer. So nice and clean in a separate file. We also can automatically apply these configurations in our DB contacts, we just need to add this line. So model builder dot apply configurations from assembly, and we just say which, which assembly the configurations are contained within. So this is a, a new feature. I think it came in in, in 2.2. Um, before that, we had to either do it manually or write our own um, code to, to apply it automatically. Now, the most important thing with working with any framework which is conventions based is to understand the conventions um, because that's going to make us more productive. So you can see here I'm configuring the employee entity but right off the bat any of you who know entity framework well will know that I don't need this line. By convention it will recognize that an employee entity with an employee ID or an ID um, just by itself will be flagged as entity by Entity Framework as being a key. So when you're working with a conventions-based framework, it's important to first understand the conventions because that's going to make it easier for you to, to work with that system. You'll be more productive and your code will be simpler because of it. So I can just remove anything like that. So I want to just touch one more time on the repository pattern. So obviously in this application I've chosen not to implement it, but we should definitely talk about a good reason as to why we might implement the repository pattern. So in a complex design, we might like to implement the repository pattern at an aggregate route. So an example in this application would be an order with order details. And why would we do that? Well, we would implement the repository at the order level and not at the order detail level. And in this way, we would control how orders can be created, updated, and deleted. We'll make it easy to encapsulate that logic so that our developers can't go directly to the order detail where we haven't written the correct logic around adding, updating, and deleting order details directly. So remember, with the repository, with design patterns, First, figure out what the problem is that you're trying to solve and then apply the appropriate pattern. Oops. All 
Okay, so key points for the uh, persistence layer. It's independent of the database. Uh, using EF Core, we can switch providers. It, we use Fluent API configuration over data annotations. It's uh, simpler to, to wire up and it keeps our domain free of extra attributes. Uh, we prefer conventions over configuration and when we're working with a framework that is convention based, we need to understand those conventions clearly. And we should automatically apply all entity type configurations. We can do it with one line of code, so that way we won't forget. Okay, next the infrastructure layer. So within the infrastructure, it's essentially our implementations. Um, persistence, API clients, file systems, email slash SMS services, the system clock, kind of an important one, anything external. So let's have a look. In this demonstration, I've kept the infrastructure layer quite simple. Um, I've got my machine date time, which basically has a couple of properties. It just has now and the current year. Um, any, anyone think why we might want to um, actually um, implement machine date time uh, and only have core depend on the interface I date time rather than using date time directly? Sorry, what's that? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Testing? Yep, yeah, testing. Testing is the, the main reason that comes to mind for me. So if we have some logic that we need to test, um, and perhaps that logic is only um, can be tested on a Tuesday, well, if we're using datetime.now directly, well, we can only test that on a Tuesday. Maybe we can write some logic in our test to check that it's a Tuesday and, and only run. Um, but with an iDateTime interface, we can, we can mock that out and make sure that it's a Tuesday. Another nice advantage that, that, that I came across is that I was able to switch this out for an implementation where the end user was able to supply the date time for the system. And this was used for testers so they could actually configure the date time to test things that were time and date based. Um, so they could advance the system clock, bring it back to the current date time, bring it back in time. That was quite useful too. So we have a... Um, machine date time implementation there. And then I have my ultra fast notification service responsible for sending notifications. So we saw the I notification service implementation in core, and this is the, uh, sorry, the interface in core, and this is my implementation. It's super fast, but the messages don't go anywhere. Okay, so no, a point, an important point to make about the infrastructure layer um, is that no layers should depend on infrastructure. Infrastructure depends on core, but we shouldn't have, for example, presentation depending on infrastructure. We might have something in presentation that wants to send a message, for example. But when we do that, we're actually forced to write logic in presentation, logic to orchestrate the communications between presentation and infrastructure in order to send a message. Now that's logic that we can't reuse. We want to avoid that. We want to push that logic into core so that when we change out that presentation layer, we don't have to move that logic as well. So it's an important point. All of the logic that we have for this application should be carefully encapsulated within core. Okay, so key points. So the infrastructure layer contains classes for accessing external resources, such as file systems, web services, SMTP, and so on. It implements abstractions and interfaces defined within the application layer, and no layers should depend on infrastructure. So next, the presentation layer. So what's in our presentation layer? It's, the, it's our clients. It's the SPA, whether we're using Angular, React, or Vue. Could be just a web API, Razor Pages, MVC, or even web forms. Let's take a look. So what I want to show you here is something that helps tie all of this together. We're going to take a look at the controllers. So I have a products controller. And I want to show you a typical example. So this is how controllers were typically built. We would have a products controller. We would inject the DB context directly. We would return entities from the controller. Um, and we would accept entities in order to, to update persistence. Uh, we would have lots of logic in here. And generally, it would get 
hard to work with. There's a couple of problems with this. Um, the first one is that the, the DB context, the persistence, is one of the lowest levels of our system. And the controller itself is, is, is one of the highest levels of our system. So when we bring those two things together, we only have one place to write our logic. And that's in the controller, that's in the actions. Um, so that's not great. Uh, and as you know, there's lots of problems with returning entities um, from controllers and using them outside of this area. Um, for example, if we have a product and it has a, a collection of categories um, and that relinks back to a product, that's going to be a circular reference. Um, there's also security issues. Um, let's say we're updating a customer and we're not supposed to update the customer's email address, but then someone overposts and supplies the email address anyway, even though it wasn't on the form. Um, well, now they've changed the email address to their email address. They can reset the customer's password, um, take over the account. Um, so there's lots of issues um, involved in doing that. So we can control that much better. Let's have a look at a newer version. So in this version, I started using CQRS. And uh, with, with CQRS, in this implementation, I wasn't using Mediator. I just added all of the interfaces to the commands and queries that I needed. Now, this was a lot better. I have a lot of kind of boilerplate here in order to get dependency injection to wire all that up for me. But when we look at the actions themselves, they're now really simple. They're just one or two lines of code. Um, no longer working with the DB context, no longer encapsulating any logic. So even that is a, is a, is a great step in the right direction. The logic is now in its um, respective command or query, so it's quite simple. So minor update here. Um, we started using from services. So this is a nice little attribute with the .NET Core uh, dependency injection. We're basically saying to dependency injection to inject this query for us. So we don't have to um, add all of those commands and queries. So it'll just inject it and we can go query.execute, inject the command, and we can execute that. Nice and simple. Okay, and this is where we introduce Mediator. So with Mediator, all we need to do is inject iMediator, and it knows where to find the, the handlers that are associated with a command or query. So then we can just say mediator.send this get all products query, or mediator.send create product command. So it's nice and easy, but now of course we have the power of the mediator pipeline, so we can do a lot more with the requests and the responses that are moving through our application. I think I'll go to the latest version now. So not too much has changed since we introduced mediator. I've, um, I have a base controller where we're using pro property injection to get mediator, so I don't need to um, add anything to the constructor. I can just inherit from this base controller. Um, but you can see it is really simple. This controller doesn't contain any logic. Um, it's, it's basically become infrastructure. It just has a, a, a single responsibility for products to turn a product's request into a product's response. That's it. All of the logic is elsewhere. If we have to switch away from um, Web API to something like Nancy, it's not really going to be that big a deal. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to show you in the presentation layer um, is I also have a filter. So when we run validation in the application layer, uh, we throw an exception if there are validation errors, a validation exception. And it's up to the client how they um, handle that exception. Um, obviously, a console application is going to handle it differently to a web application. In this application, I've created a simple custom exception filter. Uh, and it essentially, for, for any exceptions that happen, um, it'll catch it, uh, turn it into a bad request, and uh, return the failures back to the client. Um, and that's going to be in a format similar to model state validation. So one point that I want to make um, here is that we should work hard to return well-defined view models. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, we could return a product with the product details 
um, in order to edit a product. But we could actually return much more information than that. We don't want our client to have to make additional requests. So for example, when we're turning a product view model, um, we can also return things like uh, edit enabled or delete enabled so the client's not forced to make authorization checks to get the additional information that it needs. Um, we can encapsulate within the view model everything that the view needs so that it's simple for new clients to use that view model and it's also simple for us to test. Um, we can write a test to see that the edit button is disabled um, by testing the view model directly. And that's something that's inside of Core. And as we know, Core has no external dependencies. So it's very easy to write tests for Core. So by encapsulating those things in the view model, we do get great flexibility in, um, in changing out our presentation layer in the future. The last uh, point that I want to make in this, in this presentation layer uh, is that we should use Open API with our web APIs. Um, so you can see here I've got an Open API um, UI. So this is the Swagger UI. And for my developers, they can come and explore this, this API. They can learn about the API um, and understand how it works. So I've got a uh, customers, get all customers here. I can click try it out, execute that and um, I can, I can kind of see the response type and that sort of thing. Um, but I can also generate code from that. Um, because I have the API specification set up, I've actually used it to generate an Angular client for this application. So if I dive into the Angular application, I have this Northwind Traders API written in TypeScript. So this, this, this is quite big. I didn't have to write any of this, um, and I can use this directly. So by implementing Open API on, on the Web API, we're actually making it easier for our developers to work with the system, and we're making it easier to, to build front-end applications. Uh, in a microservices architecture, I can also generate um, C-sharp clients, so I can make it easy um, to communicate with that, with that microservice if that's my preferred method. Uh, this application is configured to use a tool called NSWAG to generate the Open API specification, and it actually happens automatically. Um, when I build the web UI, it will build a new uh, specification and place it here in wwroot um, specification.json, and it will also generate the Angular client that you saw, um, and that's actually using MS Build. Um, so. NSWAG has a nice MS build package, and if we scroll down in this CS proj, I've got it commented out at the moment, um, don't need to, um, it actually just runs NSWAG after build, um, and will keep that up to date so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, you, usually with these tools you have two choices. You can do it when that web application is running and automatically, or you can do it offline, kind of how I'm doing it now. I find it preferable to do it offline um, because then I don't run into any kind of issues relating to um, authentication or forgetting to start the web front end when I'm trying to generate an Angular client and that sort of thing. Okay, key points for the presentation layer. So controllers should not contain any application logic. We should encapsulate that within our commands and queries. We should create and consume well-defined view models. We want the view model to contain everything that the view needs. And open API bridges the gap between the front end and the back end. I have some recommended resources. So the first is the book Architecting Modern Web Applications with ASP.NET Core and Microsoft Azure. So this is by Steve Smith. Definitely encourage reading this. Um, don't worry if your stack isn't Azure or um, ASP.NET Core. There's a lot of great value in this book. Um, this was the book that I read that first got me interested in uh, clean architecture. I think it's actually up to version 2.2 now. Next book is Building Microservices, um, so .NET Microservices Architecture for Containerized .NET Applications. Don't worry that it says Microservices, don't worry that it says Azure. Um, 
and and don't even worry that it says containers. Um, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of great value in this book. Even if you're not building microservices architecture, um, there's a lot to learn. So definitely have a read of this book. Um, the value object that I implemented, it actually has an abstract based class behind it. And that's where I got that implementation. So great book. And finally, couldn't do a clean architecture presentation without ref referring to Uncle Bob's book on clean architecture. Um, so obviously, it's a, one, of, one of the best resources. So next steps. Thank you for coming to my talk today. Um, if you're keen to learn more, um, please grab the code and slides. You can find it at bit.ly Northwind Traders and get started. Try it for yourself. I think you'll find that this approach is simple to build and maintain all the way from development to production. Thank you.